Well, so here's the, the deal. So I know the people in Ann Arbor can't see this, but you see how I, it's like this red thing over here? I got this like this plot. Mm. I was at the gym yesterday, I went swimming, and then they changed their shampoo or something in the showers. I usually don't have any sort of issues or anything. So I, you know, do take my shower, go home, whatever. That night, I like scra kept scratching. My hair fell out. <laughs> You know, like I was, I don't have a lot of hair to begin with, but I mean, it had been a while since I like cut my hair. So I had, you know, I had a good eighth of an inch of, <laughs> of, of, of hair. So, you know, shaggy. <laughs> I'm like scratching, I'm pulling out hair. I had some kind of allergic reaction to the, the so then my wife. Like, it was, well, possibly it was a different color, but it was, it was a different color in all of them. Oh. Yeah, so I mean, this would have been like a, a across the board mistake of the cleaning crew or something like that. Yeah, but I mean, that that's, I usually don't react to things. Like even if it was solvent, I probably would be fine. I just don't have, if I had hair falling out, it was really, yeah, it should have been concerning. My wife seemed very concerned. <laughs> Um, probably more concerned than she would be of that. That she'd be like, it's a go Mondays. <laughs> You've seen enough man <laughs> We do actually watch that show together when they, because that's the celebrity one, right? Uh, Bear Grylls has one yeah. where they have like, the President Obama was on it one time and Roger Federer was on it and, you know, where you have these. It, it has to be really interesting because you know you you know that they're not really putting these celebrities in dire dire danger, right? You know, I don't think Roger Federer went and climbed the side of a mountain without like, a, you know, when he had the U.S. Open two weeks later, right? You know, I'm pretty sure there was a whole lot of camera crew stuff going on there. You know, I don't think they let you know Obama <laughs> scale scale something super dangerous. Um, well, the funny thing is, um, I've seen like actual survivalists who look at Bear Grylls and say, "Yeah, no, he's shit." Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I'd be my main advantage of you know surviving in the wild is I could live off my own fat stores for a while. <laughs> so, like, as long as I have water, I will outlive you. <laughs> huh? Well, I mean, that's true, because then that's a whole other logic problem, is as, as a group, we have to decide, you know, <laughs> who do we consume first, right? I mean, you got the buffet over there, it's like, or, you know, pick a random other person who's definitely got less meat on their bones. So, I mean, <laughs> I wasn't even targeting at you, I just assumed. <laughs> There was some old, uh, I don't even, I don't remember what the show was from, some comedy show that, you know, like, when a, you get stuck in an elevator, you know, it kind of talked about the stress of being stuck in an elevator, like, how long would it actually take till people reverted to cannibalism? <laughs> and they were, like, doing it like it was a real experiment, you know, they had this, like, picture of the people in the elevator, and they're in there like, it was, like, 15 minutes or something, not very long, and it was, like, guys, like... <laughs> <laughs> it's like I haven't had lunch. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, okay, <laughs> so uh, homework for today was the last uh, part of our of chapter what two or chapter one? Uh, what was oh path right? So this guy took a what what what. What? What are you? What are you upset about? Oh, oh! Why didn't you tell me? I just. Told you. <laughs> All right. Are you happy now? No. You're still <laughs> you're still, <laughs> still not happy. She's slightly less on. All right. So we're supposed to write uh, path, and path is done in terms of this idea of a binary search tree, right? Um.
All right, so I'm actually just going to dump all this. All right, so a binary search tree, uh, we want to have potentially constructors for these guys, uh, let's say, um, so that we can build one. So effectively, the, the bin tree kind of gave us, now you didn't have to do the constructors for it if you didn't want to for the homework, but it would have made your life maybe a little bit, a little bit easier. All right, so we might have a define. So we have two different productions in the grammar for binary search trees, right? A binary search tree can be the empty tree, right? So we'll call this guy empty BST. And this guy is a lambda that takes nothing and boils down to the empty list, right? That's what an empty BST is. Now, we can also have a node BST, call it that, define node BST, maybe it would be called a BST node. Well, let's keep it consistent, just put the dash BST at the end of all of them. So this guy's gonna be a lambda, we need three pieces of information for this guy, right? We need a number, we need a BST, well, let's call this guy a left, well, we we'll just call it l -son. that's what we've been calling the other ones and our son, all right? But L son and our son, there are BSTs, all right? So, I mean, if we really wanted to be, so we would call this a BST, we would call this guy a BST. And we did say that even though the grammar doesn't specify it, that you can assume that BSTs do follow the binary search tree rule. That is everything to the left of a BST or a node BST, um, will be have values less than or equal to num, and everything to the right will be values greater than num. Okay, so we can assume that any tree we build will be, we have to build it in terms of a legal tree. All right, we could write all sorts of functions to output a tree by adding stuff to it if we wanted to, and then make sure we follow that rules. But for now, we'll just, we're gonna build ourselves a test BST, and it will be a tree that follows those rules, okay? So we have node BST, this guy's gonna be a lambda of all that stuff, and we're gonna create a list of num. A list of that stuff. Make sense? These are our two productions of our BST grammar. Remember the BST grammar has the little vertical bar or in there, and it's either the empty list or it's a list containing a number, a left BST, BST child, or an array BST child. That's what a BST is. So these are our constructors for this guy. Now we might go ahead and give ourselves a predicate, define empty BST, and this guy would just return. Well, this is gonna be a lambda that takes a BST as a parameter and he'll return null BST. So that's empty BST. Okay, and then we might wanna have um, functions that extract for us the values, something like that. So we might have a define um, maybe node value. Lambda BST and this guy would return the car of BST. Then we might have a define node Lson. This would be a lambda BST. I have a feeling I'm going to regret some of my naming conventions here, <laughs> but because I already made a lot of spelling errors, but whatever. So node be a uh, node Lson BST is going to return the catter of BST. And the defy node R sun lambda BST will return the CADDR of BST. Okay. So little helper functions that extract the various pieces for us. We don't have to use these. We didn't have to create these. They just make our life a little bit easier. Make sense? Okay. So then for um, let's go ahead and define a test. BST here, 
And what did they give us in our uh, sample? We'll go ahead and test our constructors. So here's an example list, but we're going to build it in terms of our constructors just for... All right, so this guy is going to be, so we're defined BST to be a node BST, right? And this guy is going to take in a 14 along with, I'll kick it down a line here. And this 14 has a um, left child of this, which is a node BST. <clears throat> which has a seven and a empty list. I think I might regret having these on too many separate lines. So I'm gonna do that. We'll just fix it later. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so empty list is the left son. R son is going to be a node BST. Uh, yeah, I didn't need space right there. A node BST that is, uh, what is it, a 12? Yeah. I'll go ahead and kick this down. So that's a 12 followed by a... Oh, and this actually is not an empty list. This is a empty BST. That's what that guy is, right? And then we have another empty BST. And that was, where's our node? That's our 12 empty and then another empty. Okay, so that finishes that one. And then that finishes the seven. Okay, now we need our left or our right tree for the other one. So this is going to be a node BST 26, node BST 20. Node BST 17. So let's kick this down. Empty, empty. Yep. Okay, so that finishes that one. That finishes that one. Now we're on the right of the 26, which is empty. That, that finishes that one. And then that finishes that one. No, something's wrong there, I think. This is a 31. I missed the 31? Oy. Yeah. So uh, 26. Ah, uh, this yeah. this ends the 20. Yep, that that's that's where I that's where I messed up. Okay, so yeah, so that ends the 20 there. Then I have a just dump this right now. So then I have a node BST, which is the 31. So it's 31. Empty, empty. Isn't it an empty list? So, okay, 20, and then that the last one, there's the last one of the 20 that you're missing, I think. So we have 26, the left son. The last one is a no list with 17 and two empties, and then you need to have another empty with so another 20. So 26 has another empty. So then it's like. That's what she's saying. Yeah, so then you need to have another empty from that thing. So like, so you could delete that thing and see. Oh, this is that second empty. Well, no, no, there's no, two empties on the seventh. So this guy has two. Total. Yep, so then. So that actually belongs to the 20. The 20 has another empty. No, the 20. Yeah. So that's the 20. That's the left son of the 20. This is the right son of the 20. Okay. Boom. Oh, 
Ninja. that that finishes that that finishes that and now I'm just gonna print out test BST let's make sure it looks the way it's supposed to look oh hold on I have a I have a syntax error up here because I can't just copy and paste that in can you just type in BST to go find out what you were referring to without calling a function who this guy didn't I call it test BSC just the name. Oh, oh, yeah, this is correct. You're right. All right, so list 14, list 7, list 12, 26, 20, 17. Does that look right? I think so. Let's just, let's just assume it's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's close enough to right that we're just going to assume it's right. So if we're having issues with printing out left and right later on, it's going to burn this thing. Yeah, right. All right. <laughs> so now for our homework, we're defining what was called path yep. to be a lambda. It's going to take in a BST as a parameter, and we're assuming it's correctly formatted BST. And we're also assuming that it's taking out, it's also taking in a number we're searching for, right? And I said you can assume that this guy is found in this guy. <laughs> for the homework? Okay. Um, it wouldn't be a problem if you didn't assume that. You would just have to decide, how do I want to represent that I've run out of places to look and didn't find it? You know, so rather than come up with a, the wonky reply to that, we just are going to assume it's found. Okay. So we're going to ask some questions now. We're going to say if, uh, what do I call it, empty BST, BST? Uh, this is a little question mark, right? So if I'm dealing with the empty BST, then what am I going to do? I'm going to boil down to an empty list. Now, I happen to know that I probably shouldn't. Well, I might finally hit this depending on how I write this because, you know, it, there's going to be a point where once I find it, I have my, my answer. Right? So I would probably just conclude and not make another recursive call. So this guy is sort of, kind of, maybe not necessary, other than it does capture the situation where I say I'm searching for a number inside of the empty BST, but that kind of breaks the thing I said where you can assume it's there. So let's call this not really necessary, but it's part of the logic. Most of the time, our if should match up to our grammar. Our grammar has two different types of BSTs. We have the empty BST, which doesn't have anything in it. I have nothing to search for, so what do I do? I'm just going to say here. I could either return the empty list, or I can just boil down to the BST. Whatever makes you happy. They're synonyms, right? Okay. Else, if I'm not looking at an empty, I must be looking at a node. <clears throat> so, if I'm looking at a node, I want to look at the value associated with that node. And you could have written this in a cond if you wanted to. It wasn't that big of a deal. Would you prefer it in a cond? Do you like the F's fine? I like the fine. If it's okay, we'll keep going. All right, so we're going to be interested in the, so we're going to say if equals, we're looking at numbers, right? So if equals, we're interested in, what was it, value BST or something like that? Uh, node value. So if node value of BST, if that guy is equal to, and well, we might come back and throw a lead in here in a second, right? Um, in fact, why not put a lead in now? Well, let's do it this way, and then we'll see the value for a let. We'll use it as an instruction. So if that guy is equal to num, if I found the guy I'm looking for, then what are we going to do? We're going to boil down to the empty list. Because what are we building here? We're building kind of a list of GPS instructions, a list of lefts and rights. And if I finally landed on the right place, 
I'm probably finishing a, a series of cons. Cons is of lefts and rights. Mm -hmm. So I'll say, ah, I'm there. Here's your final cons right there. All right. Else, if I didn't find it, now I need to ask the question, which side should it have been on? Right? So we'll say if less than, okay, so this is where the, the let would come in, but we'll just keep using these. So if the number I'm looking for is less than the number I found, we'll extract that number, then that means it would be to the left hand side. So I will cons a left onto path of num and we want the left sun. So what did I call that? Node L sun. Node L sun of BST. So I'm going to cons the word left onto whatever path returns, searching for the same number on the left hand sun of that binary search tree. That's what I'll do if I'm dealing with a value that's less than num. Otherwise, I'll cons right onto our sun. Path expects two arguments but only found one. I need to say the value I'm searching for. What value did they search for in their test? They searched for 17. Right, left, left. <coughs> right, left, left. All right, so we've exhaustively tested it for everything it could possibly ever run on by using the one example. Um, but now let me show you the, uh, technically we've used node value twice here. So we could have put that guy inside of a let to give ourselves a little local variable. So I could have said let Val be the result of this guy. Then we can say Val inside here. And we can say Val inside there. Like that. So understand the use of a let because I was going to use the result of this function called more than once, I went ahead and just created a little local environment. So here is my list of variables and this kind of walks us into what we're gonna start talking about today, talking about variable environments. So this is my list of two lists, list of name value pairs where I have a variable that I've just called val. We could have called that LOL or whatever we wanted and its value will be whatever boils down from that. So I get my value. Then, in, then this stuff down here is the body of that let. So everything that I have highlighted right there is what happens inside of that local environment. Okay, so the scope of val lives and dies with what I have highlighted there. If we're thinking about this in terms of Java and stuff like that. This is a local variable to this function, to this let. All right, so I use val two different times here, so I didn't have to call this function more than once. Improve performance a little bit. All right, questions on path. Okay, so let me, how did that assignment go?
Okay, so we have 30 minutes. Anybody spend more than two hours on it? Anybody spend more than seven hours on it? <laughs> Why did you go from two to seven? <laughs> <laughs> Who jumps like that? <laughs> What's this? Someone coming back by. Now what was this? One point three. So what it was? One point three four. Three five was last time because we actually went one question back. This was the right problem, though, right? Yeah, I I uh, okay. yeah. I put it at one point three. Good. <laughs> well, there is no 1.36. Isn't there? I don't think so, because I think 1.35 is the last one, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it has something to do with G. Okay. Oh, here, look, 1.36. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Number All right, rate of procedure G such that number of elements from page 23 could be defined as some number elements. I just want to look at that real quick. My own page here, page 25. <clears throat> Do you have a question specifically? I said 23. I thought it said 25. I think it's 20. Okay. Well, I see number of elements here in 23. <laughs> <though. laughs> All right. So number of elements. Here's the, uh, uh, well, sort of kind of production for this. So it's... Um, Here's number of elements. Well, no. Where's a grammar for number of elements? If I don't find a grammar in the next 15 seconds, we're just skipping this. Because I don't want to take time before we get to our... All right, we're just going to say it's good. It's not instructive for us that they don't give us a grammar for it. All right, so... Now we're getting into some language structure stuff with uh, chapter two. Um, so some things we've already been doing. Um, so one of the things we're going to be talking about in here, let's go that route. For the next um, while, let's say, we're going to be working with this idea of environment passing interpreters. All right, and that is an interpreter that passes its own variable environment around. This is how it accomplishes scoping. It's called scoping rules. Okay. Now, if you were just imagining without looking forward in the uh, um, the book at all here, what is a variable environment? How are variables stored? If you were creating your own programming language and you wanted to create variables, how might you store them? Well, what is a variable? What's the definition of a variable? Okay. Ultimately, there must be a location in memory to define a variable, but what is a variable? The name that refers to some stuff. Okay, so name value pair. So if I had an environment that had a bunch of variables in it, how might I represent that in Scheme? Maybe a to-do list. A list of? That's two stuff. A list of two lists, a list of name value pairs, something that looks real similar to how let's work, right? 
So a let works by saying, hey, here's the environment for the body of this let. Does that make sense? So we can, imp we can implement our environments as a list of um, uh, two lists. So let's get down to uh, a grammar here. Um, the first thing they have, they kind of go through here is this idea of a kind of a base language. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I'll just kind of uh, drag us through it real quick. So here is this language known as the, the, the language of numbers, let's say, okay, where we have a baseline value. I guess it would be the language of positive numbers because this says it has to be greater than or equal to zero. So we have this predetermined thing called zero. This is a, uh, a defined rule in um, this language. This is a base value that must exist for this language to work. We have a zero. Then we have a predicate that tests against zero. Returns true if it's a zero, returns false otherwise. So far, so good. All right, then we have two functions that operate on this guy. We have the successor, which always gives us one greater than the number it was passed in. And we have the predecessor, which gives us a value that is one smaller than the value that was pressed in, passed in. Oh, this is kind of written funny. The predecessor, oh, this, yeah, the predecessor of n plus one is n. So it, what I said is accurate. It's the value that's right before it, okay? So to get the number three, we would start with a, we would take the successor of the successor of the successor of zero. That gets us a three. Make sense? If you're given a three and you take the predecessor, you'd get a two. But a two would be represented as a successor of a successor of zero. So it's the language of positive numbers represented with constructors, similar to what we've been doing. Get the relative gist to what I just said. Mm -hmm. We don't have to dive into that too much. It's you know dealing with simple things, but we kind of see how it's kind of the constructor thing that we've been doing on the last couple of assignments, right? Dealing with empty trees and um, stuff like that, leaves. Okay. Um, you know, so we can create a function called plus that takes two numbers as parameters. We ask if one of them is, uh, if it's a zero, then the answer is just y. Otherwise, it's the successor of plus, plus the predecessor of x um, and y. So we count down one towards zero until we finally get to a zero, ultimately summing up the values through successors. All right, so kind of get how that's roughly working. The recursion is built in right here because we keep decrementing x. That's effectively what predecessor of x says is subtract one from it, which is a pattern we've seen for a long time now. It's just now wrapped in weirdness, okay? But what's important for us right now is replace weirdness with it's wrapped in a either constructor or something that operates on a type. All right. All right, then here's, you know, some definitions for those types of things, whatever. Yeah, here's, this is kind of the way I said it out loud. Successor takes a value, returns one greater than it. Predecessor takes a value, returns one smaller than it. Heavy stuff. Go ahead. So if we're, if we're using the addition function in the definition of successor, why are we making a plus function? Because our plus function works on the concept of our list, a concept of our language of positive numbers. Okay. You're not wrong. I'm like Underneath the hood, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of teaching us this idea of, how do we represent our own made-up language, but rather than us having to imagine okay, so a made-up language? For that's it. Okay. They've <laughs> said, we are creating the language that is positive numbers. Okay. I know you've never heard of this, okay? But it's the language of positive numbers, and to do addition on the language of positive numbers, we operate, you know, we, we have to write our own 
addition function and we're going to call that plus that's how we add two things that represent um, values of zero or greater um, oh I really like big num I really like this problem too Oy. All right, let me just quickly show you where we're going with this because we're definitely writing bigots. <laughs> you get the, get the joke? It's actually been pronounced bigots, but... Um, um, so we're going to start talking about representation strategies for something called an environment interface. So we have an empty environment. We have a ply environment, which takes a variable and tells us the value of that variable. And then we have an extend environment, which allows us to add name value pairs to an existing environment. That's the direction we're going. That's what we'll be spending most of uh, Wednesday talking about. All right, but before we get there, we have this uh, language of, they're calling it big num representation, but it's the language of bigots. Okay. Big digits. That's what bigots stands for. Um, so implement the four required operations for bigots. That is zero, is zero, successor, and predecessor. All right. So we understand what those four things are, right? We know at zero tests whether something is zero. Or zero defines a, a value of zero in a language. Is zero tests against it. Successor gives us a value that is one greater than the previous value. And predecessor gives us a value that is one less than that value. Why does zero have a lambda expression? All functions will have a lambda expression in it. Yeah, the function zero boils, it's a function, lambda. It must be a function takes no parameters, spits out a zero, okay? Um, so constructor, predicate, function, function. Guess what we call them? Operators, operators on those things in the language. So for the bigots questions, when they talk about implement the four required functions, they're talking about these four. Everybody's cool on that? All right, so implement the four required operations for bigots then use your implementation to calculate uh, factorial of 10 how does the execution time vary blah 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 i'm going to say for this uh um question you don't have to do the second part not that it's not interesting but it's not necessarily going to be constructive for what we're doing next okay that's more of a big o notation type thing it's not uninteresting just like, everything I've highlighted, don't do. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so or you can look at it as do what I have highlighted. <laughs> Write those four functions for bigots. All right. Now understand what are bigots here. A bigot. So big num representation, this allows us to operate in various bases. And we're all familiar with that, right? Base two, base three, base four, base eight, base 16, yada, yada, yada. Okay. So the representation becomes a list containing the numbers between zero and n minus one, sometimes called bigots rather than digits. Um, this representation makes it easy to represent integers that are much longer, larger that can be represented in uh, a machine word. So the same reasons, the same rationale we've used to talk about various bases before. Okay, but now we're creating a language of something called bigots. And this language allows us to express large numbers given its base. All right, so... Let's see. We're not going to do that one. We're not going to do that one. So we're just going to do 2.1, but we're going to do it in terms of our bigots. And let's see, if they don't give us a, um, 
I don't think they give us a grammar for midgets, so I'm gonna give you a grammar for bidgets. All right, so they give us an example here. So if N is 16, then a 33, that is the decimal value 33, would be represented as one, two. So we have two in the ones place. Oh, actually it's backwards, right? We have one in the 16's place. No, other way around, it's backwards. One in the ones place, two in the 16's place. So 16 times two is 32 plus one is 33. All right, does that make sense? So the decimal value 33 is the heximal, hexadecimal value 21. They're just representing it backwards. So if I were to convert 33 and I said convert this to hex, 33 decimal to hex, that's 33 divided by 16, that is 2, remainder 1. 2 divided by 16 is 0, remainder 2. Read the answer from bottom up, that is 2 one, that's the hexadecimal value, version of the decimal value 33. In digits, we're representing it as one, two. So we're building it in the order that we found it. We don't have to reverse it at the end. It's a convenience for us because of the way lists are constructed. Make sense? This makes our life easier. But do we understand the representation of a bidget here? Now, we would have had to know what the value of n was, though. So notice here in the definition, we're going to have to have a uh, define a variable, n is equal to 16. That way, we're dividing by the right values. n is equal to 24. We're dividing by the right values, that kind of stuff. That makes sense? So somebody, we're not passing around the value of n. Somewhere in there, we're gonna define n to be a base, whatever base we want it to be for representing big numbers. So in our code here, we would say something like, um, did I paste this already? I'm pretty sure, yeah. So in our code, we would say define n to be 16, for example. And then from that point forward, we can just use n. And if we want to change our um, digit representation, we would just, if we wanted it to be 24, base 24 numbers, we would do that. Make sense? So this isn't something you're passing around. This is something that you are um, representing as a global variable so you know what, what base you're using for your digits. It's a constant. It's a constant. Yeah. Okay. So, so for example, 33 is 1, 2, 258 is 2, 0, 1. Um, so these are always the hexadecimal um, values. Uh, so what if, though, we wanted to also have, uh, you know, because in base 16, we have letters too, right? Not just numbers. So we have symbols. It's going to be numbers and symbols. Okay. It's not actually overly difficult. Just you going to have to consider that when you're writing uh, predecessor and successor. Right? If you have a 9 and you're taking the successor of it, it becomes an A. Make sense? Huh? Yeah, I said 9 plus 1 oh, is an A. Yeah, the successor of 9 in digits where n is 16 would be an A. Okay. Yeah. If you want to just be 
it should work for all of them. Um, but once it works for hexadecimal, it'll work for any of them. Just the function. You're going to have to write a function, right? That maps between a 10 and an A and an 11 as a B. Just put the whole alphabet in there and you're good. Does that, that make sense what you're doing? Okay. So... So you're going to need, is that the comment, is that comment in this? This guy? So write a conversion function that takes a decimal and converts it to the correct symbol, i.e. 10 becomes A, 11 becomes B, well, let's just do 15, 15 becomes F, 8 becomes 8. <laughs> no. That's not all you're doing. <laughs> you're answering the highlighted portion <laughs> of that question. Oh, Write okay. the four functions. <laughs> What's a zero? Is zero predecessor and successor? I'm giving you a hint here that says you will find that your life is easier if you have a little mapping function that will take something like a 10 and make it an A. It'll take something like a 15 and make it an F. It'll take something like an 8 and spit back an 8. Make sense? All right. So your solution here should be four functions. One is called zero. One is called, what was it? Is zero with a question mark? One is called successor. One is called predecessor, but it should work for big ints, bidgets, yeah, where the base is whatever is in N. So this current example, they're, the way they've explained it is they've assumed everything is base 16, hexadecimal. How do we take a decimal value and turn it into a hexadecimal value? Make sense? All right, questions, comments, concerns, bribes. All right, so this is going to give us lots of practice working with abstract data types in terms of predecessors and successors. All right. So you should be able to string together a successor of the successor of the successor of the successor of the, successor of the pretend like I've done that 10 times, of zero, and get an A. Make sense? All right. I guess I'll throw this in Slack. I have a, hang on. So then, how is that successor different from the successor in the book? The successor, successor in the book assumes it's decimal numbers. A one becomes a two, a two becomes a three, a three becomes a four, a nine becomes a ten, a ten becomes an eleven, an eleven becomes a twelve. Hexadecimal, a nine becomes an A, an A becomes a B. A B becomes a C. So then I just need like, it's kind of, like, so based on what you said, it's kind of the same function with the book, I just need a map. Well, not just map it. The book counts in decimal. Bid, bidgets count in hexadecimal. Or whatever base N is. I just gave you the example. If I have a 9 and I add 1 to it, in the way the book does it, I get a 10. Uh -huh. If I have a 9 and I add 1 to it where n is 16, so in the book, n is 10. Right? So the, the, the bidget representation of the book is where n is equal to 10. So with n is equal to 16, if I have a 9 and I add 1 to it, I get a 10 that I then need to map to an a. Okay? But you need to make it work for, it should be able to work for any size number. 
So in the end, you should be able to write a function. You don't have to do it for the homework, because the homework says just write these four functions. But you should be able to test it by writing a function that takes an n is uh, that takes in a 33 in decimal and converts it to its digit representation, which will be done in the combination of successors for digits. So then, would that be from a to b? To support all the bases between uh, two and 36, yes. No different than what we've done before with converting between multiple bases. Okay. So it'll be from A to B, right? 